Welcome back. Many subscribers have asked me for an update on Brenda Lynn, the sole surviving member of the Lynn family. Three adults and two young children viciously massacred by another family member, Brenda's uncle, Robert C. I covered the story as part of our Family Annihilator series in a video called The Lynn Family Massacre back in October 2019. Z, who was eventually convicted and received five life sentences, appealed his conviction last June in 2020 on the grounds that the evidence introduced to the jury was misleading. Just last week, the court rejected his appeal. And in the gallery, Brenda Lynn sat just a few feet behind her estranged aunt, Kathy Lynn, who still believes her husband is innocent. Now in her 20s and a research assistant at Sydney Law School, Brenda has broken her silence in a Channel 7 interview. I'd go to um, my friend's house and you see their parents and with their families. And I, I'd know that. I, I would never have that. And you'd see sometimes, you know, as teenagers, children fight with their families. And I, I'd be that. I'd, I'd give anything to have my, my family back. But whenever I see families now, I sort of smile to myself. And I think it's absolutely lovely. And, uh, but it's also very bittersweet. It sort of reminds me of what I don't have and probably never will. Police emergency. It's great. What's wrong? Dad, this is someone dying. I'm not sure. Why do you think someone's dying? I'm, I'm not sure, but this is someone killed. Killed my, my, um, my brother's family. Why am I dying? In one unthinkable night, in this middle-class suburban house on Sydney's leafy North Shore, Australia's most horrific family massacre. Five members of Brenda Lynn's family bludgeoned to death in their bedrooms. Brenda's mum, Lily, her father, Mim, her little brothers, Henry and Terry, and her aunt, Irene. Brenda was 15 her family's only survivor, and the person she turned to for help and a safe home was her uncle Robert. You went on the wall, there was, there, there was blood. On the wall, on the bed, yes. Brenda had no idea what he'd done or how much danger she was in. My goodness, she was living with her family's murderer. That is just yet another awful aspect of an awful tale. He was someone that I trusted. Tonight, for the first time, Brenda confronts the awful truth about what happened and why. Did he ever hurt you? Um. This terrible tragedy is also a story of love and hope. How a young girl who lost her entire family, her life shattered, her heart broken, managed to emerge strong, loving and grateful, forever thankful to all the people who rescued her. Your identity has been suppressed? Yes, I have. Why do you want to come out now? Because I started off being really bitter and just, I didn't like what happened to me. I was, I blamed. You know, the world, how could there be such horrible people in this world? Throughout that journey, a lot of really, really amazing people, just everyday people who've reached out a helping hand. And, and that's really changed my life and the way that I see things. It's changed my perspective on life and on people as well. The Lim family's life in Australia is typical of so many migrant success stories. Brenda's mum and dad, Lily and Min, migrated from China as students. They met in Sydney, 
and fell in love. Your dad. An absolutely amazing person. He's probably the most hardworking person I know. Tell me about your mum. She was always with us at home. We'd cook together or she'll take us to the park and she spent a lot of time with us. And very, very loving. Lily and Min worked hard, saved hard and began a family. Brenda was their firstborn. Next came Henry. He really loved tennis and badminton and a very outgoing, a very cheery person. Someone you just would, you know, automatically friends with and easy to talk to and very much like my dad, I think, in that sense. And three years later, Terry was born. He used to follow me around everywhere and I definitely felt like the big bossy sister. <laughs> all three of us had very similar interests and you now we used to all sit on the couch and read books together. We'd read the same books and so we'd talk about them afterwards. Or you know, we'd sit in front of the TV and all play, play games and we'd each have a controller and be like versing each other and wanting to win and all that. So it, it was good, it was very, very fun, yeah. Lily's sister, Brenda's Aunt Irene, also moved into their two-storey family house at Epping. She helped out by working part-time at the family's thriving news agency. The business kept Brenda's dad, Min, busy seven days a week. He's worked really hard and everything he's done was for this family, was to give me and my brothers the best education possible, for us to have the best possible life and have everything that he didn't have when he was a child. There were also regular family get-togethers with Brenda's aunt Kathy and Uncle Robert. He was an ear, nose and throat specialist in China and after migrating to Australia, opened a restaurant in Melbourne, which failed. They moved to Sydney, just around the corner from the Lynn family. Uncle Robert would play badminton with Brenda's brother, Henry. My uncle was also good at badminton. He was going over there on daily basis during school holidays to practice with him. On the surface, Uncle Robert was a caring and loving relative. As a child, you're brought up being told that, no, your family are amazing people. Your parents are always right. They're the people you look up to. And you know, definitely, there, no, there are bad people in the world and bad things happen in the world, but your family is definitely not one of them. They'll always be there to, to protect you and they're people that you can rely on. But Uncle Robert was not all that he seemed. He was secretly jealous of the success of Brenda's family and their news agency. He also harbored unspeakable desires. The target, his niece, Brenda. She had no idea. I felt like I knew my uncle and he's this amazing guy. He's my family. In July 2009, Brenda was in year 10 at one of Sydney's leading public high schools. Quiet, studious. I've had a look at past reports and uh, she even then had a very close group of friends and worked very well and cooperative with other students, but a very intelligent girl. As part of her studies, Brenda signed up for a school excursion to practice French in New Caledonia. The night before leaving, she recalls being nervous and excited. I hugged my mother, I told her I'd miss her a lot. Went back upstairs, went back into bed, got out of bed, went to go see Henry, which was, he was in the room opposite me, and tell him I'd miss him a lot as well. And that, you know, have fun without me, but I'll be back soon. By that time, Terry was already asleep. Irene was in her room as well. I didn't want to disturb her. And I thought, look, it's going to be a week. It's going to go by so ridiculously fast. I'll be back before they even know it. The next morning, her dad, Min, drove Brenda to the airport, where her school friends were saying emotional goodbyes to their parents. A lot of them were in tears, saying they would miss them a lot. And, and as a teenager, and, and I was trying to be cool, and I was thinking, you know, you guys are just being absolutely ridiculous. So I, so my dad stood next to me and sort of stood there awkwardly. So I looked at him and I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything to him. I just sort of watched everyone else be emotional and I thought it 
It was ridiculous. And then we all left. And that's the last time I saw him. I, I didn't get to say thank you for being an amazing father. Or I didn't get to tell him I loved him. And that was the last time I talked to him. I know. I, I just wish I told him that he's an amazing person and thank you for doing doing everything for us. And I never told him that I was grateful. Never told him I loved him. And I'll never be able to either. The Lynn family home sits at the end of a long driveway in the middle-class Sydney suburb of Epping. Brenda's mum, dad, her two brothers and Aunt Irene were asleep in the early hours of July 18, 2009. Brenda was overseas in New Caledonia on a school trip. It's going to be a week. It's going to go by so ridiculously fast. I'll be back before they even know it. The first inkling that something was wrong was when the family news agency didn't open. Brenda's Auntie Kathy and Uncle Robert live just across the park, about 300 metres away from the Lynn family home down this driveway. They were the first to come here that morning. Police emergency. <laughs> What's wrong? Yeah, I think someone dying. I'm not sure. Why do you think someone's dying? I'm, I'm not sure that maybe someone killed, killed my, my, um, my brother's family, the body, I don't know, I just have to call you. I need someone to come and you. Yeah, we are coming. Someone killed my brother's family. Can you see their body? Yeah, I saw. Why are you not here? Can you see the police car now? Yeah. At 10 to right, I saw them, my sister-in-law lay on the bed and I also saw the, um, the, the um, blood marks on the wall. In three bedrooms were five bodies. All of Brenda's family had been brutally murdered. My sister lying, maybe a part of bodies out of the bed and, uh, and also the, that, the, beside uh, that one is uh, I think so maybe my brother, but I, I can't see any hand, leg or um, head or any bot part of my brother's body. The bodies were found by a family member just before 10 this morning. The cause of death is yet to be established and the bodies remain in situ. News of the massacre quickly spread. Brenda was in New Caledonia with a girlfriend looking at Facebook. One of my friends sent over a link to a news article and it had a photo of my house. And I go to KO. That's my house. That, it was such, sorry. Uh, it was such a surreal sort of feeling. It, I didn't believe it. I, that's not possible. It's someone else. I, I don't know. I was, just, I was just in so much shock. Immediately, my phone started ringing from... Um, parents in the community and teachers who live in the community to ensure that I was aware that it was one of our families. Um, and I will never forget that day. 
The principal of Brenda's school, Susan Bridge, began arranging help and support for her year 10 student. My first thought was Brenda. Um, I knew she was overseas and I wanted to make sure that she was, she was safe. Brenda caught the next flight home. We got to Sydney Airport and the police met us there, walked us through to this, through this room and there was my aunt and uncle and cousin. As soon as I saw my aunt, she gave this to me, this massive hug. She was crying as well. That's when I knew it was all real. At the crime scene in Epping, police were piecing together how the calculated and brutal attack had unfolded. Brenda's mum and dad, Lily and Min, were bludgeoned to death with a hammer-like object as they slept. The killer moved quickly down the hallway to Aunt Irene's room and bashed her to death. Then the killer turned on 12-year-old Henry and nine-year-old Terry. They both woke up during the attack. Henry was killed with three blows to the head. Terry fought back and was struck six times. Anything you may say or do will be recorded on DVD, video and audio and may later be used in evidence of court. Do you understand that? Yep. Uncle Robert had discovered the crime scene with his wife, Kathy. How long was it before you noticed the blood? I'm sorry, there's a few seconds, I'm not sure. Few seconds. Few seconds. He was interviewed extensively by police. His car was seized. And within a few weeks, he and his wife were running the Lynn Family News Agency. During police interrogations, Uncle Robert claimed he was horrified by the murders. I tried to stop Kathy to look at this thing. I don't want Kathy to look, to look at some things. Yeah. yeah, that's what I want. Why was that? Scary. It, it was scary. It doesn't bear the hallmarks of a typical home invasion in that we haven't established that anything was stolen from the home. Detectives suspected the killer had a key to the house, knew its layout and knew the family well. Uncle Robert even made an appeal to catch the killer. People who haven't experienced this cannot feel what we are experiencing. If anyone can help, um, please contact the police. Uncle Robert was among the hundreds of mourners at the funeral. The enormity of the tragedy evident in a slow, painful procession of five coffins. Brenda recorded a message for the service. Mom, where are you? Why did you leave? Now that you have gone, who am I going to share my secrets with? Who is going to fuss over me every single day? I miss you. I miss you so much. Do you remember thinking through that? Do you remember doing it, recording it? I remember recording it and And I remember just not knowing what to say. It was just so soon after. And there's lots of things I want to say to them, but... And I think at that time I was really... very... I don't know if angry is the right word, but very upset that they left me behind. I 
was just so amazed by the turnout, how the school had organised, you know, a bus to take all the girls there, and just the amount of loving people that came up, came up to me, hugged me. And I remember everyone just, a lot of us linking arms and comforting each other, and um, I thought that was like really nice. We were just stuck, we all stuck together. You can't, you can't like, like replace what's been lost. Like, you can't take the brokenness out of a situation. We kept being friends. We did it as best as we could. I've been to funerals before. I've wept for people. I've never seen such raw grief in my life. Um, it, it was torrential grief. Um, it was overwhelming grief. Her grandparents were distraught. And while I absolutely respected it, it was very moving, but there was no room in that grief for a 15-year-old girl. They were torn apart by, by grief. It was distressing to, to watch um, and impossible not to be moved by. Going to the cemetery and on the headstone they're all there. And I won't be there with them. The murders had left Brenda an orphan. Where was she going to live? I really wanted to go home. I was just imagining myself living there on my own for the rest of my life. I don't know why, but I really wanted to go home. We went there, but it was just so scary walking in. Being there when it got dark, I think I pictured, I imagined what might have happened at night. All the furniture, the beds were gone and the thing with blood on it was cleaned and gone and you just knew that something had happened in there and yeah it just reminds you of it so. brenda was just 15 too young to live alone so she moved in here to the family she felt closest to her Aunt Kathy and Uncle Robert. Brenda had no idea she was now living under the same roof as the killer. Five members of the Lynn family are dead. The killer has not been found. The sole survivor, Brenda Lynn, contemplates returning to live in the home, but she's 15 and needs someone to care for her. She moved just across the park, here into the home of Aunt Kathy and Uncle Robert. My aunt and uncle, they were the substitute family I had, and I lived with them for a long time. They took me to school, made my school lunches, if I needed anything done, they'd help me out. They were the next best thing to my family. But school principal Susan Bridge had serious doubts about who Brenda had chosen to live with. She'd witnessed a disturbing encounter between Brenda and her uncle Robert. A spider web is tangled up with me. He was so physically very close and face only this far away, speaking loudly, rapidly in Chinese. 
Brenda with her head bowed down, tears falling down. It was clear he was trying to get her to agree to something. I did feel that I had seen a side of Robert that was a potentially dangerous side. What did you say to your husband that night when you went home? I think I've spent all day with a murderer. She told me she went home and said to her husband that night, I just had lunch with a murderer. She knew then. How did she know? He was definitely not a murderer in my eyes. and He was just a, an uncle, a family guy. That was it. A year after the murders, Uncle Robert had become a prime person of interest to the homicide investigators. Have you got any idea who may have been responsible for the murders? I don't know. Have you thought about who may have been responsible? No. Bloody footprints at the crime scene matched the size and style of a pair of ASICS gel elevation joggers owned by Uncle Robert. The only bedroom where there were no bloody footprints was Brenda's, suggesting the killer must have known she was not at home at the time. I just got a gut feeling that he was a dangerous person and I was very worried for Brenda's safety. I did share those with the police, uh, but that was all I could do. I mean, what else could I do? Susan introduced Brenda to a lawyer, Patrick Parkinson. He too began to suspect Uncle Robert, even though Brenda didn't think it was possible. I think she didn't believe he was, could have been guilty um, for a very, very long time. And I'm sure that that was uh, an important mechanism for her to cope with it, with it all. How could one believe that your uncle has murdered the rest of your, of your family? But evidence against the uncle was mounting. Police installed cameras in his home and recorded him destroying a shoebox that matched the shoes worn by the killer. They put some secret cameras into the house and there was evidence of him taking that shoebox and cutting that up and flushing it down the toilet. And in Uncle Robert's garage, under a chest of drawers, one of the most damning pieces of evidence, a smear of human genetic material known as Stain 91. It matches the DNA of several of the victims. According to the best expertise that the prosecution could bring forward at least, seemed to indicate the mixed DNA of four of the victims. On May 5, 2011, nearly two years after the Lynn family murders, Brenda's uncle, Robert Z, was arrested. He was surprised, I think, to, be, to have the police arrive at his door. An absolute shock. I knew he didn't do it because he's a family member and he, I, I knew him. But during the first trial, Brenda was forced, for the first time, to confront all of the evidence police had gathered against her uncle. The blood in the garage, the footprints matching his shoes, the knowledge of the house, and the uncle was secretly recorded in jail, confessing to a cellmate that he'd sedated his wife, Kathy, in order to sneak out of their house unnoticed. Realising that he might be involved with something that was life-changing something that was yeah completely eye-opening is there anything else you want to tell me about him things he may have done how he ever made you feel i think at the times after the murders he and as a teenager myself i was very insecure very, I didn't know what I was doing. And, and he knew that he read it very well. Uncle Robert had taken advantage of Brenda at her most vulnerable and in the most despicable way. 
But she found the strength to trust her lawyer with the shocking truth. She revealed Uncle Robert had been sexually abusing her since before the murders. Brenda revealed something that she didn't think was relevant to the uh, murder trial, um, but which I thought was. And so I think the trial judge had no choice but to start the trial all, all over again. On the opening day of the second trial, sensational new evidence. The prosecution claims Robert Z's motive for murder was his sexual obsession with his niece. He killed her whole family, everyone she loved, so Brenda would be forced to live under his roof. Did your uncle, Robert Z, sexually abuse you? Yes, he did. And it, that's something that I'm not very, I'm very private about. And it's something that at this point in time, I don't feel comfortable talking about as well. So I hope people can respect that and respect my privacy. And you know, at one point in time in the future, maybe I will be you know, able to talk about it. But just with everything that happened to you, with everything you were going through, I can't begin to imagine just how it made you feel. At, at this point in time, I haven't quite processed it properly and I don't even know how I'm, I'm meant to feel about this or how I'm meant to describe or how it's affected me. Do you remember the moment you realised that maybe this was part of his motivation to do what he did? For a moment, I did think that, but I also don't think that something like this would warrant him to kill five people. I don't know what goes through his mind, and I can't be sure, and I don't think I ever will be sure about why he was motivated to do what he did. It's Zay. Zay. Justice would take years. The second trial was aborted when the judge fell ill. The third trial ended in a hung jury and Uncle Robert being released on bail. I'm grateful to be home and I'll continue to fight for my innocence. <clears throat> At about 10 a.m. In January this year, the jury in the fourth trial convicted Robert Z of five murders. You are sentenced to imprisonment for life. Brenda's evidence of sexual abuse had been suppressed by the court. It was finally addressed by the judge earlier this month as she sentenced Robert Z to five life terms in jail. The court was told that he was driven to commit the unthinkable crime by a sick and depraved obsession with Brenda. First, the offender's sexual interest in Ms. A.B., as evidenced by his sexual interest in her before the murders and his serialised sexual abuse of her after the murders, when, as I have noted, upon the death of all members of her immediate family, she became a member of his household. Do you feel relieved that it's out there, people know? I'm not quite sure yet because everyone who knew me before the murders or were close to me after know already, but it's still fairly strange having all these people who know so much more about me. The love for you from people who don't even know you is extraordinary. It is indeed. Um, I, I wasn't expecting it. I've been on... on, on on the internet and just having a look at through all of them and some of the comments are just so lovely. I don't think I've seen one bad comment so that's been very very encouraging to me. And also is it not wanting to have this define who you are because you are so much more than what happened to you? I hope that's the case. I hope people can see that as well. Brenda Lin is on a pilgrimage to Guangzhou, China. 
retracing her family's past. The family massacred by her uncle seven years ago. I've never been so close to fire. Oh, that's so loud. Oh, here comes the smoke. <laughs> this is where her parents, Min and Lily, are from. Brenda's come here to honour their memory. Does it make you feel a little more connected to your family heritage being here? Oh, definitely so. I'm, um, to understand it a little bit more and to understand the environment they grew up in and I think through that you sort of understand what sort of people they were like and maybe the life they might have had as well. So um, it, it means a lot to me that you know, I can still connect with it in yeah, some sort of form. One of the things I noticed the most was whenever you speak to me about your family, you talk about them in the present tense. I, I noticed that too as well because I like to think they're still here and st still are with me today. Yeah, I hope they're looking down on me and still seeing how I'm going and but it, it's hard because they're not physically here with you. You've seen humanity at its worst. Yeah, I have. And you've also experienced and seen humanity at its yeah, best. I have, but it took amazing people in the wider community who've done amazing things and I've seen that the majority of humanity being, I think I've seen the good in people. This was like the, sometimes like the serious discussion table. <laughs> Back in Sydney, it's a relief to see Brenda can still be a happy young woman with her old schoolmates. Once Brenda came back after everything had happened, we all just really looked after each other. Um, which was really nice, special. Under this tree, after the murders, Beck and Pip were part of Brenda's group. In the simplest ways, they helped her through the darkest of times. Treating her just as normal was the only way we knew how. Um, and just felt right just to do normal teenage things, just hang out, um, watch movies and do makeup and hang out as we'd always done it just felt really right these friends have remained close to brenda in the years since her uncle robert murdered her family his wife her aunt kathy still refuses to believe he's guilty he is innocent we believe that he is innocent we are keeps fighting for him oh, i was very hurt and disappointed by that because when i when I gave evidence, I didn't, I told the truth. And she used to send me messages saying that he was innocent. He's being framed by the police. I hope one day she can realize that. All I did was tell the truth. She's better off not with him. A key person in Brenda's journey back to some kind of normal life is her high school principal, Susan Bridge. How have you been? I've been fine. Take a seat. Let's sure. catch up. Yes, definitely. She talks with Brenda regularly about life, family and the future. I learned as much from Brenda as anything I may have given her. What did you learn from Brenda? I was always worried that she wouldn't remember how to love, that, that that would be something that was also taken from her. I needn't have worried. She, she taught me that love is the most important. A few days ago, a small but very special gathering of friends They've come together to celebrate the beginning of a new chapter in Brenda's life. Despite all that she's been through, she's been able to help so many people already, and I know she'll like help so many people in the future as well just by sharing her story. Brenda's just been such a great encouragement to us, saying things to us like, hope is the only thing that keeps everyone living. And Brenda's former school principal, Susan Bridge, 
wouldn't miss this for anything. Hello. Hello, darling. I have said to her some time ago now that it is my dearest wish that one day she will invite me to her wedding and that one day I can attend the christening of her child because she will make a wonderful mother and she will start a fabulous family. Susan Bridge tells me she can't wait to be invited to your wedding. <laughs> and then... If that ever happens, I'd be, yeah, lovely. Because it's um, things like this where, you know, graduations, weddings, where traditionally you've got your family there. So it'd be really sad no one came. <laughs> but as in, um, it reminds me, I think it's times like that makes me miss them the most because it reminds you so much that they're not there. But Dad Min, Mum Lily, little brothers Terry and Henry and Aunt Irene are never far from Brenda's thoughts. How do you honour them? I like to be someone they're proud of. I think just doing the things they would have wanted me to do and would have liked me to have done. So how do you see your future? What, what do you want to do? I'm sure that I would like to do something to help other people in the future. I, I want to be able to show kindness to people, to others, the way they've sh shown kindness to me because it's made a, a very, very big impact to who I am now and what I have now. And I'm extremely, extremely grateful. He is four years into his punishment for killing the Lynn family. So what is time for Robert Z when he's serving five life sentences? A course of offending that can only be described as heinous in the extreme. It took four trials spanning three years to secure the convictions and 10 minutes for him to learn he was unsuccessful in appealing against them. The appeal court did not accept that a miscarriage of justice occurred. Z maintains he didn't kill his brother-in-law Min Lin, his wife Lily, their two boys Henry and Terry and Lily's sister Irene in their North Epping home in 2009 and claims he had no intention of taking over the family business. So his lawyers lodged an appeal Appeal, criticising the expert evidence provided on Stain 91, a small blood spot which contained DNA from four of the five victims found in Z's garage. It was misleading or confusing to the jury, causing prejudice, but the appeals court did not agree. Robert Z appeared via video link from jail and put his head in his hands when the judges handed down their decision. His only and final option now would be to appeal the convictions in the High Court. Will you be going to the High Court? His wife, Kathy, would not say. Her niece and sole survivor, Brenda Lynn, sat metres behind her in court, a once close family split by greed and bloodshed. Thanks for watching, and remember to subscribe for more murder, mystery, and mayhem. Until next time.